Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are starting tonight in Maui with the news so many have been waiting for. A key lifeline now back up and running. Look at this, with this trail of cars now driving the main road past Lahaina, reopening for the first time since those wildfires incinerated the town. It's an important milestone in the very long road to recovery, but it is still just the start. People can get past Lahaina now, but they cannot get into the historic downtown. That's the part that's been hardest hit. It is still very much a disaster zone. Our team now getting its first glimpse of the aftermath through rare access embedded with FEMA in this area. And this... This is what it looks like. Cars just fried to a crisp. Houses stripped down to the concrete frames. This was once a neighborhood. People used to live here. Now it's just piles of twisted metal. Search teams there are still looking for the remains of people who could not make it out, with at least 106 people dead so far. NBC News has confirmed the faces and names you see here. As among those killed, most of the bodies have not been identified yet. And even with that grim reality, new stories tonight of miracles in Maui. Survivors coming forward, more families reuniting. In one instance, officials found 60 people in one home. They'd been sheltering there, all of them, for days with no power, no cell service. Another person tells us he's struggling with survivor's guilt. He says dumb luck kept him alive. He left his senior living home for a dentist appointment, but was never able to return. When I came back about 3 o'clock, you know, there were already telephone poles across the main road with, you know, wires. This woman came walking down the road that had just abandoned her brand new Subaru that she just paid for, was walking with a bag under her arm, and she told me that Lahaina Town was all burning. He's worried about his neighbors now because he says nobody even knew to leave. They thought the fire was out, but he says it reignited. Nobody left. Nobody left the place, you know, it wasn't that, didn't get to the point where they had told everybody, you know, you have to evacuate. They either were burned alive in their place or, you know, were walk, trying to, most of them couldn't walk, didn't have cars. It is difficult, it is emotional to hear all of these stories. Dana Griffin is live for us on the ground on the island of Maui now. So Dana, let's start with this new lifeline for people. This road is back open. The significance here cannot be understated. It allows help to get to where it's needed, even though people can't get all the way into historic downtown. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a thing that we have been hearing from residents since this weekend. They have been so frustrated about wanting to open this road because there are people that live in Lahaina in the higher elevations and even beyond. People who work there who have been stuck outside of this area and have really wanted to get access. This has been a very, there's been a lot of grassroots efforts here in Lahaina to try to get as many supplies and things into Lahaina and this is the opportunity for people to do that and 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 I think it's it's something that people have been wanting to see and even the governor him, himself had to say you know I've been listening to people and I and I realized that this is something that I needed to do and that it could be a benefit for people and so this is why the road is open and will be open until 10 o'clock tonight Hallie we're also seeing that as more things open up more non-locals have come in right there is this push pull now with some tourists in some instances coming back into some of these areas and locals having some feathers ruffled about it right that is not being well received necessarily talk yeah. about this because on the one hand you know obviously maui makes a lot of money from tourism but on the other um it is a catastrophic loss that they are suffering from they are grieving still yeah and hallie it boils down to respect I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do. We were talking about the people who were upset that a group of tourists took the snorkeling tour out as they were still pulling bodies out of the water. They felt that was so disrespectful. And the big concern is resources. They want to make sure the people that are in Lahaina and beyond have enough resources for themselves. That's why a lot of locals have said, hey, do not come here. We do not want you here. You've not only got the people who live here, you've got hundreds, possibly up to a thousand people from FEMA and other uh, agencies that are helping with this rescue effort. And I I think someone who kind of helps to drive this point home the best is pro surfer Kyle Linney. Listen. What I would say to tourists is like there's a time and right now is maybe not the time for over there. That being said, we don't want to have an economic collapse on Maui because <laughs> before tourism was the number one industry here on the island, please come, but just come to the right places. 
And I think the heads of the tourism and business industry have said, hey, there are other islands in Hawaii that you can visit. And if you're going to come, just stay out of the way and don't take the resources. And if you come, you know, try to help if you can. There is somebody who's coming uh, who we know will, at least in the eyes of some Hawaiians, they hope will be bringing resources, and that is President Biden and the First Lady. We have learned today they are set to visit Maui on Monday. Tell us about what the expectations are for that visit, what you're hearing from locals about the president coming into town. It carries with it, obviously, a spotlight, but also some logistical hurdles. Yeah, I think there's been a little bit of mixed reaction. Some people thought the president should have been here a lot sooner, but others said he should not have come because that would have been a major distraction. And with this highway closed down, it would have hampered the recover, the search and recovery effort because, you know, when the president rolls into town, you've got to close down streets. People are, are things are, are put, are come to a grinding halt. And I think the president, as he mentioned, said he wanted to respect that. And the governor said that they came up with a time that would be right when they were in a good place place to finish most of the search and recovery. The governor says they anticipate they'll have 85 percent of that decimated area searched for the missing. So if that happens, that is a, that is major progress. And then it felt more appropriate for the president to come. He's going to be visiting with survivors, first responders and, and, and local leaders here. Hallie. Dana Griffin live for us there near Lahaina. Dana, thank you very much. Back here on the East Coast. We now know when Georgia prosecutors want to take former President Trump to trial, and it is soon, relatively soon, so soon, in fact, that legal experts say it's probably going to get pushed. March 4th, that is the date the Fulton County DA is proposing after charging Mr. Trump and 18 others with scheming to overturn his 2020 election loss in that state. That would once again pit the political calendar against the legal calendar. Why? Well, that's one day before Super Tuesday. That's the biggest day on the primary calendar with a bunch of states voting. Willis also wants arraignments in the case to happen the week of September 5th. Now, remember, Mr. Trump and these 18 other co-defendants have until next Friday to surrender in the case. So she's proposing arraignments then the week after Labor Day. As all of this happens, NBC News is learning in just the last couple hours that some supporters of the former presidents are posting the addresses of grand jury members in Fulton County who indicted him for this alleged scheme to overturn that election loss. Some context here. In federal court... We don't know the names of those grand jury members. Different in Georgia. They make the names of those people public. You can look them up in the 98-page indictment. What is not public are their addresses or their pictures. That's now spreading on some of these fringe websites and on X, formerly known as Twitter. Blaine Alexander is part of the team that scooped that story for us. She joins us now from Atlanta. Blaine, we'll get to that in a second. But first, let's talk this news about the calendar here. We know that Fonnie Willis had said she wanted a trial maybe within six months. She's now proposing March 4th. It seems like that is probably not going to happen because of how broad a scope this case has. Fair? I would say so. And there are a number of attorneys who can file responses, who can file a number of things to kind of gum up this process. You know, when you think about a start date, um, just with one uh, defendant, that could drag on for some time just because there are legal motions that go back and forth. But when you talk about 19 different sets of counsel, perhaps with 19 different motions and questions and things they want to ask, that could certainly mean that this gets pushed further down the road. So, yes, this is a proposed start date. Uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of what comes in the next few weeks that the judge signs off on it. The other date, though, that we saw from this and that we're kind of circling on our calendar is September 5th, the week of September 5th, rather, because that is when she is wanting arraignments to happen for these 19 defendants. In there, she said that they would be notified by mail within five days uh, of, their, of their date to appear. So we could also see, while we're talking about this parade of people coming down to surrender, we can also see a trickling of arraignments uh, throughout that week as well. Hallie. Explain this logistically, Blaine, right? Because for people who are like, okay, so when is Donald Trump going to show up? That's not a super clear cut answer, right? For the surrender or the arraignment, which appears to be two separate things. Absolutely. We don't know when he's going to show up. We know those talks are happening right now. We know the Secret Service is part of those talks. Uh, there obviously have been staking out, not staking out, but just kind of looking around Fulton County, uh, walking around, seeing what it could look like for terms of security purposes. Uh, but we do not know what day he's going to come for either of those, Hallie. Let's talk about the new reporting that we just mentioned on some of these grand jury addresses being put out there publicly. Walk us through how you and our colleague Ryan Riley learned that this was happening and the implications of this, right? Because, again, the names of these people were public, but it is a different set of circumstances I, now. Sorry, I've 
lost IFB, the beauty of live TV, so I can't hear what you were teeing me up with. Um, but I do know that you said that you wanted to talk about that reporting that I had with Ryan Riley. So I'll go into that because I do think that that's a lot to talk about. Um, that was something that Ryan Riley, a fantastic uh, tip by him, fantastic work by him. He got a tip from a group called Advanced Democracy. So this is a group that's a nonpartisan research group. Uh, basically, they spotted the names and addresses of these grand jurors uh, on a kind of fringe dark website. Uh, we're not naming it, of course, because we don't want to draw more attention to it. But uh, flag that uh, to Ryan. And also, not as it, only is it being posted there, it's also being posted on other social media sites as well, which is certainly concerning. Here's what the president of that group said, uh, basically talking about the fact that it is uh, concerning that something like this happened. Um, I'll read the statement to you. But basically calling it concerning that something like this happened is becoming all too commonplace to see everyday citizens performing necessary functions for our democracy being targeted with violent threats by Trump supporting extremists, Hallie. So certainly very concerning. And when I reached out to the Fulton County DA's office and the sheriff's office, they're not commenting on it. Blaine Alexander, live for us in Atlanta, a total pro, as always, uh, even with some of those technical malfunctions. Blaine, thank you. An appeals court ruling out in just the last few hours virtually guarantees now another huge fight over abortion access at the Supreme Court. We are learning today that this court now, the appeals court, is upholding part of a decision to limit access to this abortion pill that is widely used. Now, here's the thing today, right? As of this moment, nothing changes when it comes to access to mifepristone. But judges in the Fifth Circuit are ruling partially in favor of the anti-abortion group that brought the case, saying that the FDA did not take safety into account when it loosened up some restrictions in 2016. Laura Jarrett is joining us now. So, Laura, the big takeaway, like as we sort of laid out, yes. it is not that anything changes right now. That's right? the it, practical upshot. Yeah, that's the practical yeah. upshot. It's yeah. not like this came out and something is no. going to happen for sure. Yeah. So then explain why this is so significant and where this goes. And the reason nothing is going to happen is because the last time this happened, there was chaos, or at least proposed chaos, by the Justice Department and the pill manufacturer who said this is going to upend everything. It's right. going to cause a complete disaster. So the Supreme court back in April said, let's just go a little bit slowly here, go through the normal process, go back down to the intermediate federal appeals court, the Fifth Circuit, and that's what they did. And that's why we're here now. But this could get rocky again if the Supreme Court says, we don't want to hear the case, in which case this decision is becomes operative so again. Then that's what why happens, this matters. Let, let's fast forward, yep. right? Let's say the Supreme Court decides, no, we're going to yep. take a pass. Let's yep. say they do that. Yep. Then what's the practical impact? Then we are as if we are in a like uh, sort of time machine and the operative position of what happens vis-a-vis -vis Ms. Burperstone, you can still get it, but it's harder to get. You can't get it by mail. You can't use it as long into your pregnancy as you can currently. So all the operative to like sort of conditions under which right. you're using this drug revert back to the old days. Give us your sort of best gut check assessment as our resident Supreme Court watcher here. Do you think the justices will take this one up? Absolutely. It only takes four justices to get it. They already weighed in once. They understand that the Justice Department's position on this is that you can't just go like up ruling the FDA, upending the regulatory framework like this, especially in this kind of posture. It's a nationwide decision from one judge in Texas. They're going to take it up. What they do with it, that I'm not willing to predict yet, but they're going to take it up. And I would never ask you to make that prediction. <laughs> Big picture, too, though, this could have implications beyond simply this particular abortion. That's pill. been the argument all along, right. is that it's not just about abortion drugs, it's about everything. And if you can have a group based off four people who arguably didn't have standing because they weren't affected by the drug that has severe implications for all drugs on the market for the FDA. Laura Jarrett, thank you so much. It's great to see you in New yep. York. Appreciate it. So listen, actor Alec Baldwin, it is possible he could still end up facing charges for that deadly movie set shooting on Rust's set because this new report commissioned by prosecutors says it wouldn't have been possible for the gun to go off unless somebody pulled the trigger. Now remember, Baldwin has said all along consistently that he was holding the gun but did not pull the trigger when it fired the shot that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. But this new analysis now includes some frame-by-frame -frame images from video of what happened, noting that Baldwin cocked the hammer of the gun and that his finger appears to be on the trigger. Remember, the gun went off when Baldwin was practicing this move, you see here, of drawing the gun across his body. These frames from the fast draw rehearsal appear to show his finger on or near the trigger, at least as pointed out here. Representatives for Baldwin declined to comment on the findings of the new report. Antonia Hilton is joining us now. And Antonia, part of this, I think everybody thought this was done. Prosecutors in New Mexico had said, no, we are not going to bring involuntary manslaughter charges against Baldwin. That happened this spring. 
But now the door is cracked open, it seems, for him to potentially face those charges and maybe even others again. That's the significance of this new analysis, right? That's right, Hallie. And you're right also to describe this case as a bit of a confusing one that has gone up and down. And then at the center of it all has been the questions about the status of the gun, the shape that the gun was in both on set and after the fact during all of the investigations that have unfolded since the shooting in 2021. But here's what we now know. Alec Baldwin may well be facing charges after all because this new and independent report and analysis has found that essentially it would have been impossible for the gun to have fired without him directly pulling the trigger, applying that pressure. They mentioned at least about two pounds of pressure in order for this gun to fire. And that in their investigation, they were unable to find any errors or malfunctions. And that was the key question that had led prosecutors to initially drop those charges. They thought that there had been some kind of modification to the gun, that there must have been a, a malfunction in it, and so the charges were dropped. But now, if there is no malfunction, no evidence of error, that opens the door here. And we reached out to the special prosecutor. They say that the door here is open, but no decisions on charges have been made yet. We'll find out about that more in the coming days. But this really flies in the face of, as you mentioned, sort of the story that Alec Baldwin has told all along. He's consistently maintained his innocence, that he didn't pull the trigger, and has said that while someone is responsible, essentially, it's not him. But these photos that have come out, they show him rehearsing, repeatedly pulling the gun out. And in these close-ups, you can see his finger there on the trigger. And that's what these investigators believe now uh, must have led to the fatal shooting, the firing of this weapon that then, of course, killed Hel Helena Hutchins and also wounded his director there on set. Uh, what we do know for sure as we wait to hear more about charges, though, Hallie, is that the armorer who was on set that day, um, her name was Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Uh, she wasn't in the room but was responsible for the firearms there in the film, that she is still facing these involuntary manslaughter charges as well as evidence tampering charges. And so she is going to stand trial in December. And so mm. we expect details to continue to unfold until then. Antonia Hilton, live for us there out west. Antonia, thank you so much. In just the last few hours, federal prosecutors in New York have unveiled an indictment against an aide to Congressman George Santos, with the feds accusing this guy, Samuel Mealy, of this scheme where he impersonated, they say, the chief of staff of House Majority, uh, excuse me, Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. He's charged now with four counts of wire fraud and one count of aggravated identity theft, saying he tried to use McCarthy's status to bring in money for the campaign and for himself. The arrest comes just a few months after Santos himself was charged with a bunch of crimes in the same court, including fraud and theft and money laundering. NBC's Ryan Nobles is joining us now. So here you have, first of all, George Santos, controversial congressman fair to say. One of his backers is now accused of impersonating the top aide, one of the top aides, to the House Speaker. How did this whole thing allegedly work? Well, what's amazing, Hallie, when you read this indictment is the voluminous amount of evidence that prosecutors have when it comes to this case against Sam Mealy and the effort that he made to raise money on behalf of George Santos by impersonating the chief of staff to the, the to the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. This is what we know, that he pretended to be Dan Meyer in emails and communications and phone calls to donors hoping to solicit money on behalf of the campaign of George Santos and that he did it for a significant amount of time. Uh, and this wasn't just to benefit Santos, it was also to benefit himself. He was a paid fundraiser. He was able to take 15% off the top of every dollar that he raised on behalf of the Santos campaign. He even created an email account with Meyer's first initial and last name, and he signed the emails with Meyer's full name and title. Uh, and in fact, the uh, uh, indictment also alleges that he bragged about this practice to Santos himself. Uh, he even said at one point that he admitted to a faking the identity uh, of a high-profile person uh, to a big donor in order to try and solicit a donation from him and went on to say that everything he does is high risk, high reward in everything that he does. Of course, uh, in this instance, it appears to be more risk than reward as now as he, he is facing uh, several felony counts in, in a very serious legal trouble uh, for this individual tied directly to George Santos. Ryan Bye. Nobles, thank you very much for that. Wild story indeed. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, the Blindside family clapping back today against Michael Orr's claims. What they're saying about his allegations that he was not, in fact, adopted in a story that ended up with an Oscar-winning movie. That's coming up. Plus, why Target is blaming its first sales slump in years on a kind of backlash. 
from the corporate tightrope. It's now walking when we come back. One of the most visited art museums in the world says it's dealing with a big breach that looks like an inside job. We'll explain in the five things coming up. But first, lawyers for Sean and Leanne Tui say new allegations by Michael Orr dropped like a bomb on the family as the former NFL star accuses them of profiting off lies about their relationship that led to the Oscar-nominated movie The Blind Side. I am at a loss, as is Mr. Paris and Mr. Singer and everybody else associated with the Tuohys as to why or how uh, he has come to the position he's come to, but uh, he has. Remember, Orr claims in a new lawsuit that the Tuohys never actually adopted him like he thought they did, but instead pressured him into entering a conservatorship. And then he says they made a ton of money off a movie that includes things like, again, the adoption claim, which court documents show never happened. But a source tells NBC News the Tuohys have not gotten as much money from the blind side as Orr says, and that all five members of the family got an even split of $700,000. Orr's lawyer not responding to the specifics, but saying, I'm quoting here, we believe that justice will be served in the courtroom and we hope to get there quickly. NBC's Guad Venegas is joining us now. So walk us through some of these new allegations now by the Tui family. It was a kind of a bombshell when Michael Orr came out and filed this lawsuit. Now the Tuohys are responding. We saw their lawyer late today, and they say that some of Orr's key claims are not true. Kelly, they first shared a statement and then offered this press conference. You just showed a clip. So much information in that press conference coming from attorneys representing the Tuohys. So they talked about, first of all, the conservatorship. We know that the legal documents filed in court, it was a legal petition to end that conservatorship. So what the Tuohys are saying through their attorneys is that it was necessary to have him enter the conservatorship in order for him to be eligible to play with the NCAA. There were certain reasons why it was easier for them to enter uh, or for him to enter that conservatorship and then become his conservators. So that's what they're saying about that. Now, about the claims when it comes to the movies, as you mentioned, they say that the money was evenly split, uh, but they're also claiming that they didn't need the money that came from the film because of money they've made from their own business. So w what they're saying um, is that they were always upfront with Michael Orr about what was happening with the conservatorship. Um, <clears throat> they're also saying that at some point, Hallie, and this is where it gets really interesting, uh, Michael Orr tried to shake them down with some money. Uh, they said that at some point he contacted the Tuohys. He told them he would plant negative stories of them with the media if they didn't pay him $15 million. The attorney also said that they have text messages to prove that that could be presented in court. Here's part of that press conference with the attorney speaking of where they have gotten the wealth that they say is what actually is the wealth that they have obtained that has nothing to do with the movie. Mr. Tui sold his company for $220 million. He didn't need Mr. Orr's money. We hope that it doesn't have a chilling effect on others who want to help needy individuals. Now, Hallie, the attorney also said that Michael Orr has always had control of his finances throughout his career. In fact, he talked about how he switched from agent to agent, and he was mm -hmm. always free to make his own decisions. This controversy is so high profile, Guad. It's gotten so much attention that even some of the actors from the movie The Blind Side are talking about this. What's also interesting is that the guy who wrote the book that originated the whole thing, Michael Lewis, still no comment from him on this, right? Right, so uh, Quentin Aaron, the actor that played Michael Orr in the movie, has now released a statement. Of course, he's just the actor who portrayed the character, right? And, and this is what made Michael right. Orr so famous. He says he's praying for both families in hopes that they can somehow come to a result that makes everyone whole. The unfortunate thing in this matter is that in this lawsuit may possibly end the relationship altogether. But Hallie, the attorney spoke about the relationship when a reporter who was there today asked what type of relationship still existed between Michael Orr and the Tuohys. And the attorney said that relationship has been estranged for almost 10 years. It's just, again, so many extraordinary details coming out about this. Guad Venegas, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a jury in New Zealand finding a mother guilty of murdering her three young daughters by suffocating them.
Prosecutors say she killed her kids out of anger and resentment, pointing to her messages and online history in the weeks before the murders about wanting to do this. She had pleaded not guilty, arguing it was her severe depression that led her to commit these crimes. She is now facing life in prison. Number two, cancer rates in people younger than 50 are going up, according to a new study. And the cancer that had the fastest growing rate, gastrointestinal. Researchers say, if you're wondering why, could have something to do with things like higher obesity rates, environmental factors, sleep, physical activity, etc. Number three, a British museum firing a worker after they realized a bunch of its pieces went missing, were stolen, or were damaged. Stuff like gold jewelry, gemstones, and glass dating as far back as 15th century BC. Now there's an independent review happening to figure out how to stop this from happening again. The museum says it'll be taking legal action against the worker. Number four, Australia will not be winning the Women's World Cup that it is hosting. Instead, for the first time ever, it's going to be England heading to the championship. After beating Australia 3-1, to one, they're going to go head-to-head go head head with Spain on Sunday in what will be the first all-European final in 20 years. So definitely World Cup game calendar circling happening for a lot of people. Number five, don't shoot the messenger, but the first sign the fall is coming back. Yes, pumpkin spice, it is back at Dunkin' today. Krispy Kreme dropped its fall menu last week. Get ready for the Christmas decorations at your local store. No word yet from Starbucks on PSL on that front, but um, it's only a matter of time. So either celebrate or mourn the end of your summer vacation. The head of Target saying today the company will still keep celebrating Pride Month, but it'll look different because how it, down, how it went down this year hit the bottom line hard. But the CEO calls negative reaction to Pride merchandise ended up driving sales down, look at this, more than 5% in the second quarter. It's the company's first drop like this in six years. Caleb Silver is joining us now. And Caleb, just to remind people of this, right, there was this whole thing during Pride Month because Target had some of its merch on the shelves. There was a backlash now a la Bud Light and the sort of conservative backlash boycott there, Target is seeing a hit to its bottom line. Yeah, hit, you mentioned it, 5.4% decline. That's the first decline in three years. And the Cornell, Brian Cornell, the CEO, saying he wants Target to be thought of as a happy place where consumers come to get away from everyday life. Well, by doing that campaign, which they've done for the past 10 right. years, they brought that controversy right into their stores, and they felt like their workers were threatened. And then the backlash by removing some of those items, they got backlash from people who were supporting the pride merchandising of it. So they got the double backlash, that hurt sales, along with inflation and some other seasonal factors. So what's going to be different? Target says it'll still keep celebrating Pride. How's it going to look different? Yeah, the CEO says they're going to have a much more focused approach next year. What does, what does that, that mean? mean? Maybe moving that merchandise a little bit further back into the store, not highlighting it as much, not drawing as much attention to it to make sure that their workers remain safe and they don't get that controversy in store, which is contributing to lower sales and a lower share price if you look to Target stock price. It does speak to the tightrope that some of these corporate brands have to walk or are walking when it comes to being more inclusive, but then facing, in some instances, is backlash, but yet there are other companies that do it and don't have the same impact. I'm thinking of, for example, Nike or whatever. I mean, pick your pick your company there, but it, it's not it's not easy to say across the board that what happens to one company is going to happen to the other. Absolutely not. But you talked about Budweiser and Bud Light. That's a very cross American beer target, a very popular store. When you're merchandising that front and center in your store, you're inviting the controversy one way or the other. So it's a little bit about reading the room. And the room right now are these department stores and malls across America where the messaging is not being taken the way these companies intended to and people are getting upset. But is it a misstep for companies to back off their inclusive messaging? No, but maybe it's about where and how they merchandise that messaging that is having an impact on their sales, but also on their workers. Brian Cordell, the CEO, said their workers felt threatened. There was a lot of violence and a lot of threats happening in these stores, too. Caleb Silver, good to see you. Thank you so much. When we come back here on the show, an Ohio teenager convicted for a deadly crash while the judge called it literal hell on wheels. Plus, how animals like pigs and lizards are helping us answer some of our biggest medical questions. New details on that today coming up. We are learning more tonight about a potentially huge medical breakthrough. Scientists today are announcing they put a pig kidney into a human body and that it functioned for more than a month. That is a big deal because it brings us one step closer to something that the medical community has been working on for years, animal to human transplants. But that's not the only experiment using animals that's helping scientists unlock medical mysteries. 
Another one involves lizards, like these whose tails fall off, and millions of people who suffer from arthritis. Dr. Natalie Azar explains the connection. Tonight, animals are helping answer some of the biggest medical questions, possibly paving the way for major scientific breakthroughs to help millions of people. Today, researchers at NYU announced they've transplanted a pig kidney into a brain dead man. I've been preparing for that day in this setting for this procedure for so long to finally be able to do that was, was just really exciting. And the kidney is still kidney. working more than one month later. It even looks better than a human kidney, I think. This groundbreaking move could transform transplants as we know it. And it happens as across the country, these lizards losing and then regenerating their own tails could be key to treat more than 30 million people who suffer from osteoarthritis every day in the U.S. The humble lizard, uh, while you might not think about it very often, uh, is actually a, you know, factory of pro-regenerative processes. This is Chloe. Yes, she's named after the Kardashians. She's one of several types of lizards who drop their tails to fend off predators and then regenerate large amounts of cartilage really quickly, basically making a new one. Lizards are somehow able to turn normal everyday body cells called fibroblasts into new tissue types, including cartilage. In humans with osteoarthritis, cartilage degenerates instead of regenerates, forming a scar and making it hard to move properly. And researchers say we could all get it in our lifetimes. Researchers at USC hope that knowing how lizards make new cartilage, we can make the same kind of thing happen in people. My first knee injury happened when I was about 14. Um, the next injury happened a couple months after that. Molly Huddleston's now 31 and running through her treatments. I'm too young for a knee replacement, but my arthritis is already so advanced that some treatment options like a steroid shot are not an option for me. Uh, if we can take a little bit of what the lizards are able to do naturally and turn those fibroblasts into cartilage, um, it would have a great therapeutic potential for human patients. And this kind of research goes way beyond lizards and pigs. From fruit flies to mice, we basically use uh, research animals as way for testing our hypotheses before making the jump to humans. Nature acting as one big laboratory for scientists who are looking for answers to our many health mysteries. That newspaper in Kansas that was raided by police last week is getting the items that were taken back from local police because the search warrant was withdrawn for what they call insufficient evidence. That's according to the Marion County attorney. It's happening as that paper, the Marion County record, is hitting newsstands in Wichita today with its first print edition since police took their computers, their cell phones, some other stuff. Look at the front page headline. This is it. Seized, but not silenced. The searches were said to be part of an investigation into the paper's handling of documents with information about a local restaurant owner and whether that person's privacy was violated. Danny Savalos is joining us now. And Danny, we've covered this seizure, this raid essentially, because of all the questions it raised about the violation of press freedoms. There was this big national backlash. Now, this search warrant was essentially deemed invalid, right? That they shouldn't, they should have gotten it in the first place. What does that say from a legal standpoint? And, and as I understand it, by the state's own initiative, I think the state acknowledges or the prosecutors acknowledge <clears throat> that the search warrant was not supported by at least probable cause. And so this seems to be a voluntary withdrawal of the search warrant. But uh, to the extent that the seizure was already made, that is not much of a consolation, at least to the newspaper. Right. Here's the other thing that that uh, that has really been the case for decades, if not about half a century, is that uh, the First Amendment applies to all of us equally. The press doesn't have any superior First Amendment rights, although the court, the Supreme Court has long sort of implied that they do, but they don't really technically have any superior rights. And the other thing to keep in mind is the Supreme Court has long held since a case called Zercher v. Stanford Daily, the newspaper, that uh, innocent people, third parties, are often caught up in search warrants, and that's acceptable. So the idea that even a bad search warrant is executed on a place where obviously lots of other uh, innocent third parties or their papers are present doesn't necessarily mean it's unconstitutional. And in fact, in theory, police may even discover something mm. interesting of somebody else's. Danny Savalos, very interesting stuff. Thank you very much. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it's tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. 
Out of our Midwest Bureau, a teenager in Ohio has been convicted of murdering her boyfriend and his friend. After a judge ruled, she crashed her car on purpose with them inside it last November. The judge called her, I'm quoting here, literal hell on wheels. Officials say she floored it to 100 miles an hour, smashing into a brick building. She's got to be back in court for sentencing next week. Out of our Northeastern Bureau, police say a person's in custody after shooting off a gun at an intersection in New York. With the warning, by the way, you may find this disturbing. You can see how it happened. A police officer used his car to knock over the suspect who was pointing the gun at other cars. Nobody was seriously hurt, but police say that person's in custody and facing multiple charges. Out of our Southern Bureau, dozens of people marched on a Miami school district headquarters today. Why? To protest the state's new standards for teaching black history. Those standards have gotten a lot of criticism because they include language about how slaves, and I'm quoting here, developed skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit, with critics pointing out there is no benefit to slavery. We want to bring you now tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're looking at San Francisco and a tour getting offered there. It is not like the Golden Gate Bridge or Fisherman's Wharf. The ad for this tour says it'll go through, for example, open air drug markets, deserted stores and abandoned office buildings. The downtown Doom Loop walking tour, it's sold out. Some business owners say that the empty buildings in San Francisco could be the start of what they describe as an economic doom loop. But other city leaders say they see a way out of it. Jake Ward has the story. Nigel Kennedy used to see 12 clients a day in his barber chair. Then when the pandemic hit and the surrounding office towers emptied out, so did his place. And he began falling behind on his lease. How far behind did you get in rent? Over two years, 48000 and in the end, buried under back rent, he got the equivalent of a do-over. He was evicted, but now he's back under new terms. Every month I do a uh, monthly sales report, and then based off my sales report, they charge me a percentage of my rent. San Francisco needs a do-over, with commercial vacancies above 31 percent, the highest in the nation, and fears that a doom loop could kill off the city's downtown. This is the $2.2 billion Salesforce Transit Center. It's supposed to be the major transit hub for anybody coming here from the East Bay by bus. But on a busy Friday, the only people we've seen in here are a couple of tourists. Wade Rose runs a group that represents some of the city's biggest tenants, companies like Google, Uber, and Gap, that paid sky-high rents during the boom. But then the pandemic arrived, and with it, working from home. 90% collapse in office utilization. There's just unprecedented in a major urban uh, city in America. Wow. And at that point, landlords here went into denial, Rose says. There's a period where people pretty much were denying that something really fundamental and existential had happened. San Francisco has reborn so many times. It's been counted out so many times. Mark Babson took a 1970s office tower left empty during the 2008 recession and converted it into residential space. Could you do what you've done in this building at any one of those buildings downtown? You could do it at a number of buildings. The elevators being in the right spot, you're going to get sometimes, not all the time. That's a bonus. You could probably work around it. But the floor plate is a big one. Because offices make for long, narrow apartments, Babson had to get creative. Yep. The city under Mayor London Breed is doing what it can, offering small loans to small business owners and small payments to landlords to create pop-up restaurants and art galleries downtown. We've done this in parts of our city in various neighborhoods, like the Bayview Hunters Point community. They had a almost 50% vacancy rate, and it's down to about 10%. The days of being the hottest real estate market in the world may be over, but maybe that's a good thing. Rose says landlords are no longer clinging to the status quo and are preparing to more or less give away retail space to start the clock on what experts say will take 10 years to make downtown bustling enough to attract employers again. He points at Nigel's building, owned by Boston Properties, as an example. So they are now making their retail space, which is the, the bottom two floors of the building, is quite extensive, available to nonprofits, to artist groups, oh, wow. to entities which will come in and create interesting activities which will attract people. Boston Properties did not respond to our request for comment, but if they do change course, that could be a relief for the few businesses left. Everyone that could afford to buy out of their lease did. They can take the hit. They can cancel yeah, the walk yeah. away. Amazon Go just left. It was just, it was like the gold rush. And then all of a sudden, COVID hit, you know, and here we are. Completely changed the culture, so. 
Jake Ward is joining us now, and it is such um, it is such an interesting dynamic in San Francisco. He, you know, intense real estate market with people getting priced out. There's this gap there of the cost of living being so high, while homelessness is becoming more of an issue. That's absolutely right, Hallie. I mean, we should point out, right, that the, the general dissatisfaction in that city is reflected in things like this doom loop tour. It's not a thing that tourists are really doing. This right. is something being offered, you know, as something, you know, basically a stunt to show the disfavor, the, the disapproval that people feel about this. You know, but yeah, the homelessness situation is one enormous factor, right? There is more at this point than 7,000 people living unhoused uh, around San Francisco. That's a huge issue. At the same time, you have some of the richest people in the world holding on to uh, the real estate in this place. And you've got the people who do manage to own a home here enjoying the incredibly low mortgage rates of the last few years, so they don't want to sell. Right. So you have this incredible split between the top and the bottom of the place. At the same time, you also have city leaders starting to listen to the lessons of things like Katrina and uh, lower Manhattan after 9-11, which learned that you basically have to give away the real estate for about 10 years in order to get artists and pop-ups and restaurants Restaurants to come back so that tourists come back so that eventually an employee says, you know what, I want to work in downtown again. That is the stuff that's supposedly going to bring a city like San Francisco back. But it seems that we are just at the very beginning of what is probably a pretty long road here, Hallie. Jake Ward, you know it well. Uh, you know the city well. Appreciate you. Thank you for bringing us that story. We are coming on the air tonight with a critical lifeline back open in Maui. The main road there now operational, which is a huge boost to the recovery mission. The survivors of those firestorms are trying to pick up the pieces. Coming up, the dramatic and emotional story from one man who tells us he made it out alive because of pure luck. Plus, breaking in just the last couple of minutes, a source telling our team that the Secretary of State has now called the detained American prisoner, Paul Whelan, late today. The new details from that conversation as Whelan is in Russia and the moves being made to try to get him out. Also tonight, Alec Baldwin, not out of the woods yet, with the new possibility he could still face charges for that deadly shooting on the set of Rust. What a new analysis shows about how the gun went off on set. And a new survey out tonight with a big test for the Biden administration's push to get more electric cars on the road. Why? Because people who own those cars aren't super thrilled with their charging options. We'll explain. And how pig kidneys and lizard tails could change the game in helping treat some pretty big illnesses in people. We've got more on that and the new details later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are starting tonight in Maui with the news so many have been waiting for. A key lifeline now back up and running with this trail of cars now driving down the main road past Lahaina, reopening for the first time since wildfires basically incinerated the town. It's an important milestone in the very long road to recovery, but it is still just the start. People can get past Lahaina now, but they can't get down to the historic downtown, the part that is hardest hit. It is very much, as you can see, still a disaster zone. Our team getting its first glimpse of the aftermath through rare access embedded with FEMA. And this is what it looks like. Cars just fried to a crisp. Houses stripped down to the concrete frames. This used to be a neighborhood. People used to live here. Now it's just twisted, burned pieces of metal. Search teams there are still looking for the remains of people who could not make it out, with at least 106 people dead so far. NBC News has confirmed the faces and names you see here are among the 106 people killed. Most of the bodies have not been identified yet. And even with that grim reality, some new stories tonight of miracles in Maui. Survivors coming forward, more families reuniting. In one instance, officials found 60 people in one home. They've been sheltering there all together for days. They didn't have power, didn't have cell service. Another person tells us he's struggling with survivor's guilt, saying dumb luck kept him alive. He left his senior living home for a dentist appointment, but was never able to return. When I came back about three o'clock, you know, there were already telephone poles across the main road with lot, you know, wires. This woman came walking down the road that had just abandoned her brand new Subaru that she just paid for, was walking with a bag under her arm, and she told me that Lahaina Town was all burning. He's worried about his neighbors because he said nobody even knew to leave. They thought the fire was out, but he says it reignited. Nobody left. Nobody left the place, you know. It wasn't that, didn't get to the point where they had told everybody, you know, you have to evacuate. 
they either were burned alive in their place or, you know, were walk, trying to, most of them couldn't walk, didn't have cars. I want to get to Dana Griffin now on the ground in Maui with that just difficult reminder of what people have been through and this silver lining now, this road back open that should hopefully let help get to the people who need it and let people get back to what, if anything, is left of their homes, some of them at least. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are relieved that the road is now open for several days. People have been begging the governor to open this road because they feel like this is how you get those most needed resources there. Now, FEMA, the governor has said hundreds of pounds of, 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 of aid has gone in there, whether that's food, clothing, ice, also direct deposits. We've got a lot of people now in hotel rooms and more semi-permanent housing until they figure out what's going to be the future for them. But for people, especially here in, in Maui, there have been grassroots effort, grassroots efforts here for people to get much needed supplies. And they did not want to, to wait on that they didn't, they didn't like the red tape, to be honest with you. A lot of people tell me that with Red Cross and other groups that came in and wanted things to be organized and only were accepting certain items and others that weren't approved had to be wrapped up and taken to another location, they felt like that's not what our people needed. And so this gives them the access to drive their own trucks in if they want to help provide some of the items that they've collected. And I think people are really grateful for that tonight, Hallie. Dana, we're also seeing this uh, sort of dynamic that's happening in in Lahaina, around Maui, with tourists, right? Some of them coming back to some spots, not being well-received yeah. by locals. It is this push-pull because Maui needs tourism money, at least, you know, it did. It's still going to. But right now, this is a community and an island that has seen immeasurable grief and immeasurable destruction. It's, it's a difficult time. It really is, and I think the tough part about it is, you know, Hawaii really depends on the tourism industry. But when a situation happens like this, people don't care about the money. They care about the living and the dead. They want to make sure the people get into homes, and they want to make sure those bodies that are still missing and have not been recovered or identified are picked up, are respectfully placed at the morgue, and then let the the tourists come when they have been able to finish that. There have been some concerns about tourists still enjoying the water, snorkeling. We actually had a company earlier this week that apologized for sending out a tour. And for them, they said, we did this because we wanted to raise money to go to the Maui Food Bank. But people found that very disrespectful and they've asked people to not come to Maui because they want to make sure that the resources that are on the island go to the people that need them the most, Hallie. And I think one person that really kind of honed in on this and, and has really been using his platform to help educate people is pro surfer Kai Linney. Listen to what he had to say. What I would say to tourists is like, there's a time and right now is maybe not the time for over there. That being said, we don't want to have an economic collapse on Maui because <laughs> before tourism was the number one industry here on the island. Please come, but just come to the right places. And it's a very touchy subject because, Hallie, there's still a lot of people who got in on this road that have to go to work. And a lot of them are going to the resorts that are beyond Lahaina. Mm -hmm. So it's a situation where, you know, maybe you don't come now, but ultimately tourism is going to have to start up again. But that's just not a conversation that people are interested in having right now. Well, we know that folks on Maui are preparing for a visit from somebody else, uh, and that is President Biden. He'll be joined by the First Lady. We've learned today that they are going to be visiting on Monday. What are the expectations for that trip? So the expectation is that he's coming at a time when officials believe they will have most of that search and rescue effort complete. The governor says they hope to have it because right now they've searched about 32 percent of that disaster zone. They hope to have 85 percent search by the end of the weekend. And even the president said he didn't want to come too early because he didn't want to hamper the search and rescue that's going on right now. Because, you know, when the, the president rolls into town, everything comes to a grinding halt. You've got to stop the roadways, make sure that he's safe when he's going into that zone. And it was important to make sure that the people who live here were able to get there first. He's going to be visiting first responders, survivors, and talking to local officials about what the need is. And hopefully that comes with some sort of sizable uh, aid that will help really get this island back to its glory, at least the town of Lahaina. Hallie. Dana Griffin, thank you very much. Appreciate it.
to the mainland now. We now know when Georgia prosecutors want to take former President Trump to trial, and it's soon. So soon that legal experts say it's probably going to get pushed back. March 4th, that is the date that the Fulton County DA is proposing after charging Mr. Trump and 18 others with scheming to overturn his 2020 election loss in that state. Now, March 4th, interesting date for political nerds like me. Why? It is one day before Super Tuesday. That's when a whole bunch of states get out there and vote. Here's the thing, though. Legal experts say, yeah, that's probably not going to be March 4th. That is unlikely for this trial because of how many co-defendants there are and how long this process typically takes. There's another piece to the scheduling, too. Fonnie Willis, the district attorney, wants arraignments to happen for Mr. Trump and his co-defendants the week after Labor Day. So that's the week of September 5th. That, that would be after they surrender sometime probably in the next week or so. As all of this happens, NBC News has some new reporting, learning in just the last few hours that supporters, some of them of former President Trump, are posting the addresses of the grand jurors in Fulton County who indicted him. Now listen, in Georgia, unlike in federal court, for example, the names of those grand jury members are made public. It's in the indictment. It's in those 98 pages. What is not public, their pictures, their addresses, that is what is starting to circulate now on fringe websites and on X, formerly known as Twitter. Blaine Alexander is part of the team that scooped that story for us here at NBC News. She joins us now live from Atlanta. We'll get to that in a second. But first, let's talk about this calendar. Willis made clear as we were doing coverage well into the wee hours of Tuesday, uh, Monday morning, I guess it was, I think, um, that she wanted to see this trial start within six months. Even then, legal experts said, wow, that seems remarkably fast paced. Um, it, it is likely to get pushed past March and it is possibly likely that it gets pushed past the November election. Fair? Yes, that's because you have so many people who could really file a number of motions that would essentially gum up this entire process. So think about this. When you have just one defendant that you're trying to take to trial, if you're a prosecutor, there are a number of motions. You have replies. You've got other a number of things, uh, filings that could be put into the court docket that could slow or delay the process. Now, imagine that times 19. We've already seen Mark Meadows. Uh, his attorneys have filed a motion to take this up to federal court, to kick this out and have this tried in federal court. Likely that we'll see something from the former president's uh, attorneys as well and maybe some others try different things to kind of stall and delay and move this around so to have a trial start date by march 4th certainly when i talk with legal experts about this and then just watching the process play out does seem unlikely hallie let me talk to you about this new reporting on some of these addresses of the grand jury members being put out there publicly here what are the potential implications well, it's certainly concerning, right? So in Georgia, as you mentioned, uh, when you return an indictment here in Fulton County, the names are published along with it. What we have seen, though, and I've got to give a shout out to Ryan Riley because he got some fantastic, uh, basically, insight from Advanced Democracy. They're the ones who, on this kind of dark fringe website, saw that these names had been listed. That's already public domain. But the fact that you're seeing now the addresses, that's a tremendous security concern. That's certainly a security concern when you consider just how inflammatory and how controversial this entire thing is. Here is what the president of Advanced Democracy said. It's becoming all too commonplace to see everyday citizens performing necessary functions for our democracy being targeted with violent threats by Trump supporting extremists. So I talked with Chuck Rosenberg about this, Hallie. He is our legal expert, our legal mind here at NBC News. And he said, one, he told me he's never seen anything like this, where the names of the grand jurors are made public. Uh, um, but he also said it's something that needs to be changed. It's something that needs to be fixed. We don't know if Fonnie Willis made a motion to try and, you know, redact these names, hide these names, change up this procedure. But certainly in this case, it's something that you'd want to take a look at, Hallie. There's a politics angle, too, here, Blaine, because you have now the former vice president, Mike Pence, coming out with his first reaction to these charges specifically in Georgia. I want to play that. The Georgia election was not stolen, and I had no right to overturn the election on January 6th. We're also hearing um, from Republican strategists talking with members of our team, Garrett Haig, Kristen Welker, others, that this indictment could be a unique issue because the road to the White House goes through Georgia. I was struck by the point that, and, and listen, it's true, we're a ways out. Um, from the general election right now. There's so much focus on the primary because that is what's next. But in this key battleground state, it is the general fight that's going to matter between the eventual Republican nominee, right now the front runner is Donald Trump, and the Democratic nominee, which will in all likelihood be, of course, President Biden. Tell me what you're hearing. You're on the ground there. You're talking to people. You're talking to strategists there. What's their sense of how this plays? 
you know what, they're already forming their opinions. We may be a ways out, but people are already forming those opinions. So fantastic reporting. I want to show you a poll because what people think depends on who you ask. Some people certainly say that makes them all the more sure that they're not going to vote for the former president. But other people say, you know what, I actually wasn't really paying attention. I, you know, are trying to figure out how to figure out what's in each indictment, can't necessarily separate them. So here's a new Quinnipiac poll. 57 uh, percent Trump has over Ron DeSantis is 18 percent. Then when you look at a Biden-Trump matchup, 47 percent Joe Biden. Trump is just beneath that with 46 percent. Timing of that is important, too, Hallie. That poll was taken after the federal indictment, but before this indictment here in Georgia was handed up on Monday. So it will certainly be interesting to see how those numbers shift once we talk to people after the news of this week. Blaine Alexander, uh, great reporting as always. You have more ahead of you, I know. We appreciate you and your time. Thank you. We've got some breaking news coming into us tonight because NBC News is learning that the Secretary of State has now spoken on the phone tonight with an American detained in Russia, Paul Whelan. A source familiar with the call says Secretary Tony Blinken reassured Whelan that he is doing everything possible. That's a quote. Everything possible to get him home as soon as possible. The U.S. has said there's a proposal on the table, but Russia hasn't accepted it. Now, you'll remember that Whelan, he's a former Marine, American businessman, was wrongly convicted of spying in Russia, according to U.S. officials. Andrea Mitchell is joining us now. She's got this reporting for us. And Andrea, you know this because you've been the tip of the spear on this story, that the Whelan family had in some ways felt abandoned when exactly. other, you know, others had come home, Brittany Griner, et cetera, had come home, Trevor Reed out of Russia, and Paul Whelan did not. They'd only spoken once before since his basically essentially since Wheeler has been in prison they've only spoken once talk me through what we know where this goes well right now there seems to be a dead end there's a proposal on the table as you point out but the russians have not you know bought into it at all so i'm told that there's really no give neither for evan gershkovich by the way but paul Whelan has been there for almost five years december will be five years he is serving a 16-year sentence wrongfully convicted on a trumped-up charge of espionage. She was an American businessman, uh, you know, a former Marine. And there's really no excuse for him to still be there. They had really hoped to get him out with Brittany Griner. They thought that by offering Victor Boot, who was a highly prized to Russia prisoner mm -hmm. in the U.S., the arms dealer, very close to Vladimir Putin. They wanted him back. He's back in politics in Russia since he's back, in fact. They thought that by offering Victor Boot, that was a big enough, uh, big enough offer bait if you will to get paul whelan out as well but the russians insisted on we want one for one they kept insisting on a, a russian assassin who's in jail in germany the u.s said we can't get germany to give up a convicted murderer so that's where it stands they made some other, other offers and so far nothing's been accepted and nothing on evan gershkovich who's of course awaiting trial why now, Andrea? Why the timing of this call now? I think people might think, well, typically the Secretary of State could call somebody when there's news. It doesn't seem like that's the case. No, there wasn't real news. I think it was to encourage him. But most immediately, it was because he asked for it. He asked his consular officer. He's got a cell phone in jail. He has the ability to make a call. In the past, it was once a week to his family. So he made a call to the consular officer and said, I want to talk to the Secretary of State. And Tony Blinken did call him back, mm. or rather he called. They put it right. through the State Department switchboard, obviously. And they had a conversation. I don't know how long the conversation was, but to reassure him that they're still doing everything they can and he has not been forgotten. That's the important message. Andrea Mitchell, stand on top of all these developments for us. Andrea, you thank you. In just the last half hour, we have learned that the Justice Department plans to ask the Supreme Court to look at a ruling that could set the stage for the next big fight over abortion access. It's all about the availability of a widely used abortion pill. Here's why. In the last few hours, this appeals court has come out and says it will limit some access to the drug. That's the ruling from the appeals court. However, what is the practical impact on the ground? Nothing, at least not right now. Because depending on what the Supreme Court does, it could go back to some of the stricter conditions for Mifepristone that were in place before 2016. We've gotten this statement now in from the Department of Justice, which says it's committed to defending the FDA's scientific judgment and strongly disagrees with this appeal court's decision. Laura Jarrett is joining us now. So let's take the sort of latest information, yeah. Georgia. The DOJ now has not surprisingly gone yes. back and said, OK, here's our filing after the appeals court decision. That's where things stand. Yeah. So we had expected this because they had essentially warned uh, everybody that if this was going to happen, they 
we're going to go back to the Supreme Court. And it's part of why the way the Supreme Court structured its order was to say, no matter what happens in the lower courts, we're going to keep everything on pause. We're going to maintain yep. the status quo so that we don't have this frenzy of court filings like we had last time, where everybody was doing emergency filings and everyone was worried the pill was going to be taken off the market. Or there, not was a, there was confusion. There was confusion. Yeah. So that's why the way the Supreme Court styled its order back in April was to say, go back, do the normal process, and go through the normal steps of appeal, but we're going to keep everything on status quo until you come back to us. Once you come back to us, if we decide to take the case, then it's game on. If we decide not to take the case, then this appeals court ruling is the operative ruling, and that's when all those restrictions that are, come into play in this decision will be really important. Right now, though, like as of this moment, yes. 618 Eastern Time, Nothing changes. Nothing Access changes. to Mifepristone still exists as it did yesterday. Exactly. You can still get the drug. And even if the Supreme Court says, hey, we don't want to get back into this, you'll still be able to get the drug. It'll just be harder to get. You'll have to go to a doctor, you know, office in person. You won't be able to get the pill by mail. Might not be able to use it as far into a pregnancy. You can still get the generic version. That was a big deal here because most people are using the generic right. version. Appeals Court says that's fine. But it's just, again, it'll be harder to get it. And of course, the Justice Department's position is going back to the old regime undermines the FDA. The FDA is the one that decided the safety drugs, the safety profile of this drug was fine. Pull on that thread because the argument is from the DOJ that this undermines the FDA. Yeah. If these rulings go in a certain direction, there is an implication well beyond simply abortion drugs, right? Because then you're looking at a whole slew of drugs related to a whole slew of things that the FDA has approved. That's, that called that's been their argument all along, Hallie, because the groups that are suing are not people who take mifepristone, yeah. prescribe mifepristone, or anything like that. They're people who oppose it. They, they oppose abortion in all cases, and they certainly oppose the abortion pill. And so their argument is, if you can challenge it, even if you have no standing, how is any of this going to work? Meaning, what can of worms does that open for other drugs down the road? Yeah, that, that, that's certainly the administration concern. Laura Jarrett, thank you so much. Good to see you. Anytime. Actor Alec Baldwin, it is possible he could still end up facing charges for that deadly Rust movie set shooting because of a new report commissioned by prosecutors that says it wouldn't have been possible for the gun to go off unless somebody pulled the trigger. Look at this frame by frame analysis, right? It shows what happened, noting, uh, it, here's what it points out. Baldwin cocked the hammer of the gun that his finger, you can see it here, appears to be on the trigger. Remember, the gun went off when Baldwin was practicing this move here, you see it, of drawing the gun across his body. These frames from the so-called fast draw rehearsal appear to show his finger, as it's pointed out here, on or near the trigger. And remember, Baldwin has said all along consistently that he didn't actually pull the trigger of the gun that fired the shot that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Representatives for Baldwin declined to comment on the findings of this new report. Antonia Hilton is joining us now. And that's the crux of this, Antonia. Baldwin has said all along, I never pulled the trigger. That the guy, he didn't, he insists. He was holding the gun, but he didn't pull the trigger. This analysis seeks to show his finger was on the trigger, the hammer was cocked, that all of those, that the gun couldn't have gone off by itself, essentially. Does this mean that prosecutors could, based on this new information, charge him? They had dropped involuntary manslaughter charges. Could that change? Absolutely. It opens the door to those charges being refiled again. And in fact, we reached out to the prosecutor's office and they say that those options are on the table right now, although they have not yet made any charging decisions that could come in, you know, the very, very near future, just in the coming days. And look, this all comes just a couple months after, as you mentioned, those initial charges for involuntary manslaughter were dismissed. But that's because at that time, prosecutors believed that there had been some kind of malfunction with the gun that it had been messed with in some way and so that they shouldn't move forward. But now that an independent group, an independent detailed analysis has come out that shows that the gun could not have fired without Alec Baldwin having actually pulled the trigger and applying about two pounds of pressure onto the trigger, that r raises a whole host of questions and further complicates what has already been such a complicated sort of up and down investigation here with so many tests done on the gun and, and so many different narratives about how the gun has handled coming out of here. And, you know, as you mentioned, he's consistently maintained the same story here, that he did not pull the trigger, that someone is responsible, but that it's not him. And so much of the attention then shifted to Hannah Gutierrez Reed, who's the armorer who was on set there, responsible for handling firearms, although she wasn't in the room uh, when Helena Hutchins was shot and killed. Uh, but she's still facing those charges, going to go to trial in December. 
it may look, as we understand more what comes out of this and what prosecutors view from this information we've gotten, it may mean the same fate is coming for Alec Baldwin. It's just going to be complicated by the fact that the narrative around the gun, the confusion about whether or not it was harmed, damaged at some point, that could make this case very messy for prosecutors to try. And so, you know, th th this is not going to be straightforward. This no. is not going to be a simple case at this point, no matter what happens, Hallie. Antonia Hilton, thank you very much for that reporting live for us tonight from the West Coast. Coming up, some new details tonight. After a New Jersey Catholic school fired a pregnant teacher who wasn't married, how the state Supreme Court is ruling now. Plus, the killers just got booed on stage in the country of Georgia. Why the group is apologizing now, later on this hour. In the last hour or so, we're hearing from the author of The Blind Side, Michael Lewis, for the first time since the new allegations from the ex-NFL star at the heart of his book, Michael Orr, against the family who took him in. So here's the deal. In an interview with The Washington Post, Lewis says that people should be mad at the Hollywood studio system. He says that Orr should join the writer strike. He says it's outrageous how Hollywood accounting works, but the money is not in the Tui's pockets. Now, remember, the Tui's are the family that allegedly adopted Michael Orr, or so he thought, but in this new lawsuit, he claims they never adopted him at all. He says instead they created a conservatorship and then basically profited off his name. Now, a source close to the Tuies says that family hasn't gotten the millions of dollars that Orr says he has, or says that they've gotten. These sources say five family members split something like $700,000 from the movie that was based on Orr's life story. Essentially, this back and forth shows no sign of ending anytime soon. Lawyers for the Tuies saying late today that the allegations dropped like a bomb on the family. I am at a loss, as is Mr. Paris and Mr. Singer and everybody else associated with the Tuies as to why or how uh, he has come to the position he's come to, but uh, he has. Or his lawyer, not responding to the specifics, but saying, we believe justice will be served in the courtroom and we hope to get there quickly. NBC's Guad Venegas is joining us now. And Guad, you know, an hour and a half ago, we hadn't heard anything from Michael Lewis since this lawsuit from Orr dropped earlier this week. Now he's out in this new interview with The Washington Post, not just criticizing Hollywood, but it seems like he's also taking some aim at Michael Orr here. Tell us more. Hallie, he's sharing more details about what could have happened. Uh, Lou is saying he watched the whole thing up close, of course, being involved uh, with a book. The Blind Side was a book before it became a movie. So part of that article also shared more information as to what happened. There was the whole thing with the $225,000 that uh, were given to the family. He actually broke it down and said that half of it went to him as a writer, the other half to the family. And of course, as he mentions here, he saw everything up close. He says they showered him with love and resources. So for them, for him to be suspicious is breathtaking. The state of mind one has to be in to do that. So referring to Oler, uh, you know, as someone that understands the details of what happened, it's very interesting to see his side of things. And then, of course, Hallie, we heard from attorneys representing the Tuis today who say that uh, Michael Orr always understood he was in a conservatorship, right? This conservatorship that the legal petition was filed for this week. That's how the whole thing began. He filed a legal petition to end that conservatorship. Now, the lawyers representing the Tuies say that the reason why he wasn't adopted and instead he entered a conservatorship was to make it easier for him to attend college. They also say, the attorneys say, that the legal decisions or the financial decisions that is made by Michael Orr were entirely independent. In fact, he had control of his finances. Here's part of that press conference where the attorneys spoke about the wealth that the Tuies have. Mr. Tuies sold his company for $220 million. He didn't need Mr. Orr's money. We hope that it doesn't have a chilling effect on others who want to help needy individuals. Now, Hallie, on top of this, the, the attorneys are saying that at some point Orr approached the Tuies and asked them for $15 million. If they did not give him the money, then he said he would spread negative information about them with the press. Wad Venegas, this story, uh, more twists and turns by the minute. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one. 
We're learning tonight that three people in the New York City area have died recently from a flesh-eating bacteria, according to the New York Times. Apparently, a fourth person is in the hospital right now. The Times reports that health officials in New York and Connecticut say this bacteria could come from raw oysters or from swimming in warm salt water. Number two, a revenge porn victim awarded a big payout in Texas after her ex allegedly uploaded what court docs say was visually intimate material onto a Dropbox that was public when they broke up. A jury deliberated about a half hour before choosing to award the woman $1.2 billion in damages. A judge still has to decide whether to uphold that. Number three, New Jersey's highest court ruled a Catholic school did have the legal right to fire an unmarried pregnant teacher. The school says she violated the school's code of ethics, which bans premarital sex. The teacher says she's a victim of discrimination, but the Jersey court says the school was within its rights because the teacher knew about the requirements as a condition of her employment. Number four, Australia will not be winning the Women's World Cup that it is hosting. Instead, for the first time ever, England is headed to the championship. After beating the Australian team 3-1, to one, England will go head-to-head -head with Spain on Sunday in the first all-European final in 20 years. Number five, I know it's not even Labor Day, but there are new signs that fall is coming. Pumpkin Spice is back at Dunkin' Donuts today. Krispy Kreme dropped its fall menu last week. No word yet from Starbucks on when the PSL will be out, but if you've been jonesing for your pumpkin spice, there it is. Get ready for your Christmas decorations soon. You need some ornaments. I'm sure that's coming around the corner. So listen, some electric car owners we're learning tonight are not all that thrilled about what happens when they go to charge them up. A new survey of EV owners shows 20% of them have left a station without a charge because equipment's been broken or because the lines have been really long. It's a big problem for car makers and the Biden administration when they're all trying to convince more people to go out and buy EVs. The president has challenged the country to have 50% of all new car sales be electric by 2030. CNBC's Phil LeBeau talking with GM's CEO today about how they plan to get there. Watch. And then we've also joined the joint venture where we're one of six companies that are going to work to uh, install over 30,000. And of course, we're making sure that as these chargers, uh, you know, are installed, that they are going to have the reliability and the ease of use that they have to have. And so I think there's uh, it's a focus not only to get enough charging stations, it's a focus to make sure they're always operational. Phil LeBeau is joining us now. Great interview, Phil. I know you've been all over this story. It's super interesting here because the government wants more EVs on the road, but it seems like EV mm -hmm. owners are saying, wait a second, we don't even have enough places to charge our own cars quickly enough and functionally enough. So, like, what's the solve here? Uh, the solution is going to come over time, Hallie, and it's going to take a while because the public charging stations in this country, they're not up to snuff. Look at the latest survey from J.D. Power. They talk to more than 15,000 EV owners, and they do this every year. And they say, what do you think about the public charging stations that are out there, both the regulation one, the regular ones and the fast charging ones? Every metric across the board was lower this year compared to last year. The main complaints, it's either too costly, it goes too slow, the lines are too long, I can't get in there, the, it's the, this charger is not working. You name it, people are not happy about it when it comes to a lot of the public charging stations. Now, we should point out, the survey found that when it comes to fast chargers, Tesla supercharger network gets high marks. And that may be one reason why you had GM, Ford, now you've got a number of charging companies, other automakers who are saying, we will go with the Tesla, Tesla charging well, standard, and Tesla will make its network available to those owners in the future. Well, that's big, Phil, because like more than, uh, because a lot of Tesla owners say they actually like their charging experience. Tesla still has a monster share of the EV yes. market in this country. So like Tesla is still the industry leader on this front. Can other companies catch up? They can. It's not going to happen overnight. Look, right. Tesla sells two out of every three EVs in this country, and that's not going to change anytime soon. It's probably going to be that way at least for the next couple of years. And in terms of charging, it's just going to take some time to get some reliable public charging stations out there. And as much money is being thrown at it, Allie, it'll eventually happen. But until it happens, a lot of people are not crazy about taking a road trip in an EV. Phil LeBeau, uh, it is fascinating. I'll tell you, like as somebody who my next car eventually may be an EV, but like when do I do it? Do I do it? Do I not? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to call you. We'll talk about it. Uh, is it your only car? If it's your only car, that's a real big choice you have to make there. <laughs> okay, Phil, we'll talk. Thank you. Appreciate it. When we come back, stuff like pig kidneys and lizard tails could soon treat some pretty serious medical conditions in humans, although there's an asterisk on it. 
how scientists think it'll work next. Plus, a sold-out tour in San Francisco that may not hit the famous sites. In fact, it'll do the opposite and hit up the doom loop, as it's called. More on that coming up. One of India's biggest fast food chains says it's putting its tomatoes on vacation. We're going to explain later in the local. But first tonight, we are learning more about a potentially huge medical breakthrough. With scientists today announcing they put a pig kidney into a human body and that it's been functioning for more than a month. That is a big deal because it brings us a step closer to something the medical community has been working on for years, animal to human transplants. But that's not the only experiment using animals that's helping scientists unlock medical mysteries. Another one involves lizards like these whose tails fall off and millions of people who suffer from arthritis. Dr. Natalie Azar explains the connection. Tonight, animals are helping answer some of the biggest medical questions, possibly paving the way for major scientific breakthroughs to help millions of people. Today, researchers at NYU announced they've transplanted a pig kidney into a brain-dead man. I've been preparing for that day in this setting for this procedure for so long to finally be able to do that was, was just really exciting. And the kidney is kidney. still working more than one month later. It even looks better than a human kidney, I think. This groundbreaking move could transform transplants as we know it. And it happens as across the country, these lizards losing and then regenerating their own tails could be key to treat more than 30 million people who suffer from osteoarthritis every day in the U.S. The humble lizard, uh, while you might not think about it very often, uh, is actually a, you know, factory of pro-regenerative processes. This is Chloe. Yes, she's named after the Kardashians. She's one of several types of lizards who drop their tails to fend off predators and then regenerate large amounts of cartilage really quickly, basically making a new one. Lizards are somehow able to turn normal everyday body cells called fibroblasts into new tissue types, including cartilage. In humans with osteoarthritis, cartilage degenerates instead of regenerates, forming a scar and making it hard to move properly. And researchers say we could all get it in our lifetimes. Researchers at USC hope that knowing how lizards make new cartilage, we can make the same kind of thing happen in people. My first knee injury happened when I was about 14. Um, the next injury happened a couple months after that. Molly Huddleston's now 31 and running through her treatments. I am too young for a knee replacement, but... My arthritis is already so advanced that some treatment options, like a steroid shot, are not an option for me. Uh, if we can take a little bit of what the lizards are able to do naturally and turn those fibroblasts into cartilage, um, it would have a great therapeutic potential for human patients. And this kind of research goes way beyond lizards and pigs. From fruit flies to mice, we basically use uh, research animals as way for testing our hypotheses before making the jump to humans. Nature acting as one big laboratory for scientists who are looking for answers to our many health mysteries. The Animal Kingdom and Medical Mysteries. Dr. Natalie is joining us now. So a couple questions for you here. Um, first, you know, is there, well, let me start with, with the, the sort of pragmatic, the timeline from lizards and animals to like actually being useful in real life. How yeah. long does that take? Like, let's use this arthritis example. Oh, a long time. Years and years. Yeah. So what they, what, what, what the researchers did was that they discovered, oh, wow, there are these two cells that are working kind of a yin and a yang to allow the lizards to regenerate cartilage, but not scar because humans scar. And that's what kind of prevents us from regenerating. So they said, well, let's, let's see if they can do tails. Can they do lizard limbs? They can. They figure that out. Now they go to mice and then they go to humans. So all of that takes a really long time. It all starts off in a dish, to be honest, Hallie, before they're going to get into human yeah. trials. It's incredible, especially when you think about, like, not just how long it takes, but the way that this could help so many people. Yeah. I also, though, can't help but wonder about, like, animal rights activists, for example, and any pushback on that front. Do we know about that? Yeah, you know, this is, I mean, they're, they're, they're not sacrificing these animals. I mean, you know, that's the one thing. They're studying their cells, um, regenerating a limb or regenerating a tail. Tail. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not an expert in human rights, but I don't think, or animal rights, but I don't think that that's a major issue. As we pointed out in the piece, 
when humans develop arthritis, our cartilage de degenerates, we don't right? We generate that. We yeah. don't. And there's a huge field in regenerative medicine. My orthopedic colleagues are, are very active in all of this, stem cells and that kind of thing. As a rheumatologist, am I going to say to my patient, wait a couple of years, you might get this new lizard gel or something? I hope one day I do, Hallie, because <laughs> right now we have very little to offer patients That's right. with osteoarthritis, and it's the most common arthritic condition that affects And uh, by the Americans. way, not just for older people either. No, that's the beauty of it. Think about you know younger people yeah. with sports injuries and mm -hmm. things like that, where they, they start to degenerate, they, they traumatize their cartilage, they're destined to develop osteoarthritis in that joint. If we could halt that and regenerate cartilage, I mean, honestly, I start to get really kind of very excited when I start talking about it. I, only a rheumatologist would, but it, it's pretty exciting news, Hallie. You, you lit really up is. talking about lizard gel, Dr. <laughs> Natalie. I've rarely <laughs> seen you so enthused. So excited. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's so good to see you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Coming up here on the show, a big reversal tonight after that newspaper raid in Kansas. Why police are now being forced to give the stuff they took back. Plus, why people in Ireland were allowed to take out money from their bank accounts that they didn't have. So that newspaper in Kansas that was raided by police last week is getting the items that were taken back from local police. Why? Well, the Marion County attorney says the search warrant has now been withdrawn for insufficient evidence. You can see some of the video from that raid here. It's happening as that paper, the Marion County Record, is out on newsstands in Wichita and elsewhere today with its first print edition since police took those cell phones, computers, etc. Check out the front page. This is the headline, Seized but Not Silenced. The searches were said to be part of an investigation into the paper's handling of documents with information about a local restaurant owner and whether that person's privacy was violated. Danny Savalos is joining us now. So, Danny, wait a second. So police go. They raid this newspaper's office, which raised, by the way, tons of questions about First Amendment rights, et cetera. But that search warrant has been deemed invalid. Is that a big mess up? Of course it is. How does and that happen? It happens all the time. In <laughs> fact, defense attorneys like me are constantly filing motions challenging the constitutionality of search warrants. But unfortunately, the Constitution contemplates that sometimes innocent third parties, their things may be located next to the things to be searched. So not only do you have an interesting First Amendment issue here, you have an interesting Fourth Amendment issue insofar as it relates to people who were not the subject of the search warrant, other journalists whose things were, of course, seized, searched, documented, uh, put a little tag on it, and basically looked at. But can you put the toothpaste back in the tube? In other words, the search has already been carried out. So now the paper has been deemed invalid, right? Okay, rip that up. Search already happened. You can't go back in time. You're thinking like a criminal defense attorney, well, Hallie. God, You're exactly yeah, right. Second career. Okay. Yes, you, and that is exactly the, the complaint that we have. Even if, and I think reportedly the uh, prosecution has said, hey, well, we returned it. We didn't really look at it. Well, take a look at that video. They obviously looked at it. Maybe they didn't scour it. Maybe they didn't take notes on it. But in order to seize it, in order to execute, there you go, in order to execute a search warrant, you have to look at the things or else you're taking things that are outside the search warrant. So when they claim that, hey, we didn't look at it, no harm, no foul, we'll give you everything back, you know, that's not really much consolation because law enforcement has now presumably seen things that it was not supposed to. And they don't unsee things. Right. Even if they constitutionally can't use it, even if it's fruit of the poisonous tree, once they see it, they can use it in their mind and get to the uh, crime another way. How does this relate to kind of the First Amendment discussion here? Because there have been so many questions raised about this. That's partly why this small town sort of paper in Kansas is making such big national headlines after this happened to them. Here's the fascinating thing. We think of the press as the vanguard of the First Amendment, that they embody everything that is the First Amendment. But yet the Supreme Court has said that well, they don't have any special First Amendment rights that the regular public doesn't have. And yet, time and time again, you could say that the Supreme Court and other federal courts have implicitly recognized that when it comes to the press, the First Amendment has to be extra safeguarded, even though I think they're pretty quick to say, but no different than anybody else. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, spiritually, in the Constitution, they are different. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Good to see you Good here see in you person, too. as always. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it's tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. From the country of Georgia, the band The Killers had to say sorry. After getting a bad reaction from the crowd, they got booed, apparently because they invited a Russian fan on stage. Look what happened last night.
they're definitely booing. When it comes to the war in Ukraine, Georgia's government has been accused of supporting Russia, but public opinion there largely supports Ukraine. The killers apologized afterwards on Facebook, saying they thought the crowd would be okay with this fan coming on stage and that they didn't mean to offend anybody. Out of India, Burger King says its tomatoes are taking a vacation. I'm quoting a vacation from many menus because of skyrocketing prices there. Food inflation is hitting the country hard. Prices of tomatoes have more than quadrupled. A lot of McDonald's and subway chains there have also taken tomatoes off their menus this week. Out of Ireland, one of the country's biggest banks had a huge glitch that let some customers take out money they did not have. People could transfer up to $1,000 from their accounts, regardless of how much was in there in the first place. <laughs> so, well, yeah, of course you're going to line up at the ATM. You sure are. You're going to wait in line to take out that money. However, the bank has said, no, no, you can't actually keep it for free. That's a snafu. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's San Francisco with a new tour being offered that's not like go see the Golden Gate Bridge or the Fisherman's Wharf or whatever. The ad for this now says it's going to go through open air drug markets, deserted stores, abandoned office buildings. It's called the Downtown Doom Loop Walking Tour, meant to raise attention to what's going on in San Francisco. It's sold out. This one big store owner, joined by others, have said these empty buildings in San Francisco could be the start of what they call an economic doom loop, but other city leaders say they see a way out of it. Jake Ward has the story. Nigel Kennedy used to see 12 clients a day in his barber chair. Then when the pandemic hit and the surrounding office towers emptied out, so did his place, and he began falling behind on his lease. How far behind did you get in rent? Over two years, 48,000. And in the end, buried under back rent, he got the equivalent of a do-over. He was evicted, but now he's back under new terms. Every month I do a uh, monthly sales report, and then based off my sales report, they charge me a percentage of my rent. San Francisco needs a do-over, with commercial vacancies above 31%, the highest in the nation, and fears that a doom loop could kill off the city's downtown. This is the $2.2 billion Salesforce Transit Center. It's supposed to be the major transit hub for everybody coming here from the East Bay by bus. But on a busy Friday, the only people we've seen in here are a couple of tourists. Wade Rose runs a group that represents some of the city's biggest tenants, companies like Google, Uber, and Gap, that paid sky-high rents during the boom. But then the pandemic arrived, and with it, working from home. 90% collapse in office utilization is just unprecedented in a major urban uh, city in America. Wow. And at that point, landlords here went into denial, Rose says. There's a period where people pretty much were denying that something really fundamental and existential had happened. San Francisco has reborn so many times. It's been counted out so many times. Mark Babson took a 1970s office tower left empty during the 2008 recession and converted it into residential space. Could you do what you've done in this building at any one of those buildings downtown? You could do it at a number of buildings. The elevators being in the right spot, you're going to get sometimes, not all the time. That's a bonus. You could probably work around it. But the floor plate is a big one. Because offices make for long, narrow apartments, Babson had to get creative. Yep. The city under Mayor London Breed is doing what it can, offering small loans to small business owners and small payments to landlords to create pop-up restaurants and art galleries downtown. We've done this in parts of our city in various neighborhoods, like the Bayview Hunters Point community. They had a almost 50% vacancy rate, and it's down to about 10%. The days of being the hottest real estate market in the world may be over, but maybe that's a good thing. Rose says landlords are no longer clinging to the status quo and are preparing to more or less give away retail space to start the clock on what experts say will take 10 years to make downtown bustling enough to attract employers again. He points at Nigel's building, owned by Boston Properties, as an example. So they are now making their retail space, which is the, the bottom two floors of the building, is quite extensive, available to nonprofits, to artist groups, oh, wow. to entities which will come in and create interesting activities which will attract people. Boston Properties did not respond to our request for comment, but if they do change course, that could be a relief for the few businesses left. Everyone that could afford to buy out of their lease did. They can take the hit. They can get yeah, to the yeah. walk away. Amazon Go just left. It was just, it was like the gold rush. And then all of a sudden, COVID hit, you know, and here we are. Completely changed the culture, so. 
Jake Ward is joining us now, and it is such um, it is such an interesting dynamic in San Francisco. He, you know, intense real estate market with people getting priced out. There's this gap there of the cost of living being so high, while homelessness is becoming more of an issue. That's absolutely right, Hallie. I mean, we should point out, right, that the, the general dissatisfaction in that city is reflected in things like this Doom Loop tour. It's not a thing that tourists are really doing. This right. is something being offered, you know, as something, you know, basically a stunt to show the disfavor, the, the disapproval that people feel about this. You know, but yeah, the homelessness situation is one enormous factor, right? There is more at this point than 7,000 people living unhoused uh, around San Francisco. That's a huge issue. At the same time, you have some of the richest people in the world holding on to uh, the real estate in this place. And you've got the people who do manage to own a home here enjoying the incredibly low mortgage rates of the last few years, so they don't want to sell. Right. So you have this incredible split between the top and the bottom of the place. At the same time, you also have city leaders starting to listen to the lessons of things like Katrina and uh, lower Manhattan after 9-11, which learned that you basically have to give away the real estate for about 10 years in order to get artists and pop-ups and restaurants to come back so that tourists come back so that eventually an employee says, you know what, I want to work in downtown again. That is the stuff that's supposedly going to bring a city like San Francisco back. But it seems that we are just at the very beginning of what is probably a pretty long road here, Hallie. Jake Ward, you know it well. Uh, you know the city well. Appreciate you. Thank you for bringing us that story. Still to come, some new backlash tonight against Bradley Cooper. We're talking about why and who's coming to his defense next. That does it for us for this hour and for the one before it. It is good to be with you as always. You can find us anytime streaming on Peacock, Hulu, YouTube, and more. Just search Hallie Jackson now. We've got much more coverage here on NBC News now coming up with Top Story in just a second. See you tomorrow. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.